Hello, Suki Chan. Nice to see you today. Very, very honored to meet you. Hi, Sally. Lovely to meet you too. Um, we're supported today by Mark Marriott and Basia Richard uh, for our exciting in conversation here today with Suki Chan, a photographer, visual artist, filmmaker and installation, I believe. Cool. You managed to cover a, a, a huge amount of artworks there. Fantastic. It's Your work feels so very personal with a very intimate pay, pace and uh, purpose to the work. You seem to manage to show us such beauty in the phenomena that you capture. Could you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you first came to photography? Um, I first came to photography through a love of light. Um, as a child, I, I was about six, um, five or six, and I would look up at the sky at sunset. And um, this was at the time when my father didn't live with us. He was already in England and, I have vague memories of him working there um, and whilst the rest of the family was in Hong Kong. I would look up at the light and think, ah, oh, over there is England. And obviously over there was just a, the way that the clouds would form in the sky, but it looked like it looked like an island in the sky. And because in those days there wasn't the internet, you couldn't just type in England and then be presented with these images of England, I had to just imagine something. And so I was always very drawn to light as a child. Um, and then I think over the course of my practice, um, I started to understand more and more about myself and what drives me as an artist, the kind of environment that um, I like to work within that enables me to, to thrive. So when you, when you notice that there is this purpose to engage, then I think for me that that's really true of my work. And I know that when I make work, I want to connect with people. That's in fact, the driving force of my work is to interact with people and connect with them. And a big part of it is to show people um, things that are unseen or overlooked in our daily lives. We're, we're often very busy. When we go somewhere, we don't really look around us. And I think this this is even more so nowadays because we're just always looking at our phone whenever we go anywhere. So for me, I, I really do want to show people the beauty in the world, but not just beauty in terms of what is conventionally beauty, but um, finding the beauty in unusual circumstances, finding beauty in the tragedy, you know, the, the tragic moments of life. Um, so yeah yeah it really feels when you watch your work that you are trying to very much to connect to a sense of a, a, a global consciousness almost um how did you transfer these initial interest in photography across into film um it's a very slow process so uh, when i think about photography as a child i at school we did um we had a dark room. It was amazing that we had a dark room in those days. And I remember being given a, a black and white um, camera. It had black and white film in it. And I somehow remember going to the graveyard and just taking photographs of um, the this graveyard. And I think for me at that point, I, would, I was already interested in time and interested in um, human beings, the human condition. But I mean, obviously, at, in those, at that time, I didn't have the words to explain what it is that I'm interested in, but there was this fascination with time and with, not so much with death, but just something about time with, with the human lifespan. So, you know, I found myself wandering around the cemetery and taking photographs and I don't have these photographs anymore, um, but I still remember them and, and the detail of, of looking at the, the sort of marks on the on the on the on the headstones and and the reading about the lives you know that, that it was someone's mother or someone's husband and that they're sorely missed and you know all of those being intrigued about these lives of people that I would never meet because they're dead and and just you know trying to understand and almost imagine well what were they like what were their lives like and I think that fascination has has stayed with me throughout my practice, you know, right from when I was at school, when I was, before I did my GCSEs. And I think 
throughout my time at university and then the last couple of decades since leaving university, you kind of just find your feet and you find aspects that you want to develop that is um, instinctively kind of um, you and not what you should be doing. I think sometimes we have these sort of ideas that, oh, I should, I should make work about this or I should make work about that. And I think, and it's just being aware of those kind of forces that play out in your mind and you just follow your heart and you go, well, actually, I want to do this, even if someone might say, well, it's been done before or it's not fashionable. I think it's just finding that strength to follow your heart. And then eventually you come out the other end and you realise what you are discovering and uncovering is very uniquely you, even though in the beginning it might have seemed very much, oh, that's really passe or it's been done. And I always hate those comments because I find them very unhelpful when you're nurturing someone, especially at the beginning of their artistic journey, because we all come from somewhere that is shared. So um, it's too early on to say, that's been done or that's sort of not fashionable um, because you don't know what it is at the other end that they're going to do. Um, so I, mean, I, I can also explain, I know that I haven't answered the question about, you know, how did I start with making films? But again, I've just tried to say that it's such a long process. So um, I went to Goldsmiths College and I, I didn't, um, focus on photography. So I did a course that was called Art Textiles, which is very conceptual. It's essentially fine art. In fact, the courses have now merged because they they can't be bothered to separate the two anymore. But it was using materials um, as a visual language, a way to convey ideas and emotion. So that was my course. And so there wasn't any video or film within it. Um, and in fact, I, I actually made sculptures out of resin um, for my degree show. And then after the degree, I then decided to expand my practice and move into installation. And the thing with installation is that quite often you can't take it all in with, with one camera perspective. You've got to shoot it from several different perspectives to try and convey what the encounter is because it's a spatial thing. So very naturally, I was having to document my work and really think about, OK, well, what's, what image comes first and then what comes next? And how do I translate that experience of the installation into a series of images that people can then see and go, ah, oh, that's your installation? Um, and so I think I was just always thinking about camera perspectives, about framing. Um, and then more and more gradually, I, I think I just became more comfortable to bring in photography into my work. I never called myself a photographer and it's only recently that I call myself a filmmaker because for me, I'm not limited by the medium. I'm driven by the idea. So whatever it is that I want to convey, it may be sculpture, installation, film, photography, stills. I will use what I need to do. So that's why I think the practice might seem like it's um, it encompasses a lot of different things but I think it's I'm very comfortable working with different materials because I think materials convey um, different things so it just depends on what the project is about and that's how you choose what kind of materials you use um, and maybe that comes from the course because I've just always been very comfortable with bringing in material um, and, you know, how it feels, how it feels to touch or what are our material associations with certain things. Um, so it might be nice to go to the slides because um, we've got some photos that I wanted to show you. Uh, and this is thinking about the beginning of um, my filmmaking career. And so I wanted to bring you to this place, which is about just under 7,000 7, miles from the UK. It's in a village called Tsilhang Tun, it's in Hong Kong. And as a child, I left, um, I left when I was about six or seven. And so when I was growing up in the UK, I was always very aware of this other village that I left behind. And 
I was also very aware that I never lived in this house that my older siblings had lived in. And so this house, I wonder if I can point with it with my cursor. Okay, so I hope you can see it, but essentially there's these big houses here. And the one that I didn't live in is this one here. It's this tiny little one that's concealed behind this big tree. And over the years when I would go home to visit my grandmother, it would just gradually become more and more overgrown. And I'll show you the front of it. So this is this tiny little house which spans from this edge here to here. So it's literally the, like the width of a tree and it's a tiny house. But I was always really curious about this old house that my siblings, you know, told me about it. You know, every year I would go home and then I would see it become more and more dilapidated. So this is the house here with the roof completely fallen in. And this photograph was actually taken um, maybe a year or two after I shot the first film on Super 8. And I remember distinctively when I suggested to my parents that I would make this film inside this old house. My dad was really concerned that I was going to a house that was dilapidated and the roof might fall in on me at any one point. But obviously in your 20s, you're just, you're invincible. You're, you're not worrying about any of these things that could potentially kill you. You're just making your art, of course. So. I, I just said, well, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. And then I, I would take my Super 8 camera and I would literally sit inside this house and wait for the light to move around. And so here in this, in this image, you might see a tiny little bit of light here that's entered in through the cracks in the roof. And what I wanted to do as part of this art project was to reconnect with this house, with this village that I felt that I hadn't really gotten to know because I'd been in England all this time. And really simply to just sit and experience time passing by in this space. But at the same time to use a technique called time lapse, which I knew would in some ways convey my experience of the village, the way that every year I would go back and I would notice something has changed. And that made me think of this technique time lapse, which again is all about condensing time so that we can see the changes happen over a shorter period of time. And this is um, this is a, a view of the wall. And the way that the paint would peel off was just stunning and evocative of the passage of time and the patina as well, the, the different layers of paint and the histories. And in some ways, I felt like I was trying to um, excavate that history. And the marks that people left behind within this house, there was a little bit of a, a, a broken bowl that was on the floor still. And, and, and just imagining that period of time when my siblings would be running around in this house and breaking things or drawing on the walls. Um, so that was the inspiration for making moving image works. And before that, I hadn't made it. I hadn't made a film before. Um, and I talked about earlier, you know, what kind of environments do we thrive in? And I think for me, the environments that I thrive in is when commissioners give me a lot of freedom. So I was very fortunate that a curator asked me for a show, what would you like to make? And I said, I'd like to make a Super 8 film. I've never made one before, but as part of the commission, I'd really like to learn how to make a Super 8 film, how to splice it. And I was able to get that support. And that was, and that started to be off in making films. So for me, that's quite a momentous, a, a big milestone for me because that really has set me off because now I am moving into film and I'm, I'm making, short films and moving on to a feature. So I always think back to this moment of um, of how it all started with photography and with time lapse itself. So from making this short Super 8 film, I then wanted to make another piece, which again is about hacker uh, architecture. So I am half hacker and hacker means, if I translate it word for word, guess people. Okay. And 
It sounds really romantic. I mean, for me, you know, we're all guests. I, I always say to people, we're all guests in this world. We're only here for a little while and then we're gone. When we're here, we take care of things. And then when we're not here, that baton gets passed on to someone else and someone else then has to take it over and care for whatever that is left behind. Um, so I was very intrigued about this term, guest people. How did it come about? Because I'm half hacker. And when I then delved into it, I realized that actually the term was really a very derisive term. It wasn't meant to be romantic or um, in the way that I've described it. It was really a term that the locals would describe these migrants from the north of China to the south of China, because it's like your guest people, you don't belong here, like go, I guess the equivalent of go back to your own country. But obviously, this was happening within a country. Um, and it was just because resources were so scarce that the locals didn't like other people coming in because then they're fighting for land. And I was really intrigued about this relationship between um, people who felt that they belonged somewhere and other people who have newly arrived. And so I, I then wanted to look at the specific architecture, which for me was very much about um, you know, protecting yourself. It's circular, it's almost like a castle. Um, there's only there's only one doorway into it, which is here. I'll show you. This is um, this is the doorway in, but this is also the doorway out, and it's like a fortress. So it's almost like um, you're keeping people out, and they're keeping the people within it safe. And I wondered, you know, did this architecture evolve out of this slightly precarious feeling that oh well, the locals don't like us, and so we we build a wall essentially, and. And then I did a residency where I literally just went around this village and knocked on people's doors and, and just said, I, I, you know, I'd love to make an art film and um, I'd love to come back next year, uh, maybe with a, with an assistant. And can I live with you for two weeks? And, and luckily we, we came by this house. And when I explained this, they, they laughed at me and said, well, why would you want to stay here? It's full of cobwebs, you know, it's, it's so, you know, uh, it's so old and I just said well you know I'm really intrigued and I explained that I'm half hacker and I'm just reconnecting with this kind of architecture and luckily they, they welcomed me and I lived with this family for two weeks and during that time I would set up my camera to shoot time lapse and I was interested in the way that the light moved around this circular space and this is one of the rooms uh, within the building and this is the first time here that I've created the camera obscura it's not focused because we didn't have a lens but you can kind of make out the the landscape outside it's on the wall here so this here is the field and this is the sky because obviously camera obscura is upside down and when we created this with cardboard and, the, and then cut a hole through out of, out of the cardboard the farmer looked at it and he was just astonished and I was trying to explain in my very bitty can uh, Chinese, because I, I speak Cantonese and they speak Mandarin. So there's already that language barrier. But I was trying to explain the kind of the physics of how light works and that you get this image that's upside down of the exterior. And the farmer was so sweet. He was just astonished that this image had magically appeared inside a room within his home. And that, you know, that those moments are just priceless because you just go, wow, that's amazing that I've managed to show you something that is really incredible. But for me, it's so incredible. Whenever you see light working in this way, you know, I'm just, I just love it. It's, it's something that just happens that is so magical. Uh, oh, sorry, that was, so that's the last slide. And then from here, it might be nice to show interval two and we'll show an excerpt, which is two, three minutes. Um, but that gives you an idea of what I made, um, what, about 15 years ago, 14, 15 years ago. So this is this is like the second film that I made after the Super 8 film. Um, and, it's, and it's the first time that I used high definition and it was around about the time when high definition came about and everyone was kind of, ooh, it's really exciting. It's, you know, it's a lot more resolution. So um, let's, let's have a look at it. And Great. Go what we're gonna do is obviously play it, but also post a um, link in the chat so you can watch it on your own screen if you want to, or you can uh, watch it in the StreamYard uh, stream. So uh, yeah, take it away. And this is Interval 2 by Suki Chan.
Beautiful, Suki. You have such a pace to your work. You're really investigating the light, aren't you, as it moves through the through time. I love the way the stars come and go as the clouds join and leave. There's something so beautiful about that. Um, okay, so really an, a, a deep interest in time and the way in which light moves and continues to move around the planet. Yeah, amazing. I've noticed that from your still point piece as well, actually, that you've picked a moment in time where to be and then you have you know, encountered what it is you, you can see there. I think a lot of people want to move their camera a lot, whereas you allow what is happening to make movement for you in that place. What, what, what then led you on to make still point, which is the next clip we want to show? Um, I think, I think there was a, about five years in between still point and interval two. I actually made another piece in between the two, which we're not showing today, which is just to confuse everybody. But uh, on Vimeo, can't we? It is on Vimeo, you can see it if you want to. It's called Sleep, Walk, Sleep, Talk. I didn't choose it because that, I made that because um, I, although I studied in, um, in London, I then made the decision to go up to Manchester to do a residency for two years. And then eventually I made my way back down to London and then I did my MA. And it was at that moment that I made Sleep, Walk, Sleep, Talk because it was coming back to coming back to an urban area and then and then being interested in um, psychogeography and how we are we are um, affected by our urban environment so that's so we're not showing that today but with still point I think it is another investigation of time and of place and looking at how how space becomes place how how it has meaning and the different layering um i suppose over the it two decades that i've been working that the kind of ideas slowly form and whenever i go to a place it is almost like a pilgrimage there is this sort of connection with the site and wanting to really understand that site which is something that i first did with my own village in Hong Kong but then I extended that to other sites and it evolved around this idea of um, what makes the sacred space our homes are sacred and in a way every year when I used to go back to that village that in itself was like um, like a pilgrimage you know reconnecting with your family home our our ancestors are, are buried in our old village so whenever we go back we pay our respects to our ancestors so that in itself is quite a a spiritual journey and so when I was thinking about you know what makes us a, a space sacred and and how is it that some of the the most sacred sites around the world are also the most conflicted sites so you know, I grew up reading the bible and reading about Bethlehem and and the, the Western Wall and all these places. And suddenly when you grow up, you suddenly hear these kind of snippets of news of what's going on. And you suddenly go, well, hang on a minute. The image that I have as a child of Jesus and Bethlehem, that doesn't link with the reality of today. Why is that? So in my usual kind of um, exploratory manner, I then decided, okay, well, I'm gonna go to some of these places and speak to the people who live there and find out what it means, what a sacred space means to them, and try and uncover some of these histories of what happened here. And, but I think also the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was something that I was very intrigued about. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't have any connections with Israel or with Palestine other than it's over homes, it's over houses, it's over, it's something that's very personal that I feel very personal too. And that was my way in. And I would go to these groups, these different religious groups and just say, I am not a Christian, I'm not a Muslim. I am actually, we worship our own ancestors. And so that was how I kind of started the conversation. And I just wanted to really understand um, the site and their connection to these spaces, but also the palimpsest because essentially it was one story layered on top of another story on top of another story. And so this layering 
was really interesting and I wanted to understand the different narratives of one site. You know, you have one site, but it has three different stories. What are those three different perspectives? And I wanted to try and engage with those three different stories because um, at that point I was, um, I was realizing that um, we see the world differently. And I was beginning to want to see how others see this patch of land that is so contested. So I think it might be nice to watch a bit of Still Point now. Yes, that would be great. So this is Still Point by uh, Suki-chan, uh, and we will post a link in uh, the uh, comments as well for you to watch on your own screen if you want to, uh, or it will be played here in StreamYard. Beautiful, Suki. You clearly travel a lot. Yeah, at that point in my life, I think I I would embrace any opportunity to travel. And Still Point came about from an invitation by the British Council to go to Istanbul and make a short piece called Istanbul. And it was when I was going around Istanbul with the group that I came across... Um, this, uh, this architecture in the Topkapi Palace. When I looked up at the dome, it just, the spaces just spoke to me in a way that I felt like I was being, um, that I felt like infinity was being conveyed to me. 
that when I looked up at the dome, I, it was almost like I was staring out into the universe. And that was really powerful. And then later on, when I came back to the UK, I thought a lot about how do I enhance that feeling of the infinite, the universe? Um, I think that's always kind of there in the work anyway, but how do I, how do I enhance that even more? And up until that point, I was making films where I wasn't moving the camera. And I think I'm one of those people that I think maybe it's like my Chinese culture. We don't speak until we're spoken to. It's almost like if there's no reason to move the camera, don't move the camera because moving the camera says something. So unless it's there's a reason to, for me, the videos were like breathing photographs and that's how I described them previously, that you allow time for the viewer almost to watch a photograph unfold and change in time and that was very very beautiful and it was also about um, the notion of the viewer inhabiting the spaces of the photographs but when I had that experience in the Top Capi Palace I then thought the camera needs to move now we need to think of a way that would work with the time lapse so that the way that the light moves across the walls I want the camera to follow it almost like like a telescope. And that's when we decided that, well, that's what we need to do. We need to adapt a rig for a telescope and use it with time-lapse. And so I'll show you some behind the scenes now from the, um, the presentation. So you, from the exit, you would have seen this section, which is the, the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, or it's the, uh, it, it's a place that has many names, um, depending on, which in Jerusalem, depending on which religion you um, subscribe to. And I found that really interesting that one place can have two or three different names. Yeah, uh, and, that, and, that, and that got me into quite a lot of trouble because I, I, um, I made the mistake of calling it the, the Western War to, um, to people from the mosque and they completely pushed back against that. And I was, I was really shocked that I had um, accidentally um, uh, yeah, it's almost kind of insulted them by using the wrong term. But this is me setting up with the minimum kit that I could carry over to Israel. And, and it's so hot throughout the day. You know, we, we had to set up at five in the morning and the project wasn't massively funded. So I had to, um, had to reach out to friends who lived in Israel. And luckily a friend of mine, um, teaches at a university there so she could uh, she could get a couple of students to help me on site and so we were there from five in the morning until six or seven at night time with with the cameras to shoot time lapse um, that was quite challenging because it was such a hot weather that um, the cameras were getting and I knew this I, I knew the cameras would get really hot so I made sure that we had methods of cooling the camera throughout the day when it you know when at noon it would be super hot and this is the still from that shoot. And this is now jumping backwards. So this is earlier on when we did that um, piece in, uh, in Istanbul, when I was invited by the British Council to, to make a film about Istanbul, which sits at this sort of junction between the East and the West, and also to explore how Islam has influenced uh, European culture. So that's me with um, a friend of mine that I brought over from the UK and on the right side of me is a is a student um, that, that is based in Israel and we had to work with the authorities and they were very very kind to allow us to cordon off an area. I mean obviously this this building is is was open to the public and it has many visitors but we were able to still film within that space. And what I loved about the space was this palimpsest that I could see, the, the different layering of the history. So it used to be a Byzantium um, church, and then it became a mosque, and now it's a museum. It's called the uh, Hagia Sophia, and it's one of my favorite buildings in Istanbul. And so this idea of this dome and how this camera would, would, would move 
around slowly as we film time lapse to to suggest the infinite which is something that I just feel that is being communicated in the architecture is so strong when I see it. But if you imagine, you know, in those days, there wasn't TV, there wasn't the internet. The architecture inspires us. When we go to these buildings to worship and we're thinking beyond ourselves, and we're thinking towards something else, you know, the greater good or whatever it is that might be your religion. I think you need something to help you focus your mind. And I think for me, I could just sense that, that's what the architecture was doing. It was really to convey those notions of this kind of celestial space. Spectacular. And this is the Holy Church of the Sepulchre, which you can see the light, the way it's hitting on the left-hand side, but in the film, it gradually moves round the dome towards the right. And it's, you know, when I visit spaces, I'm all, I'm already looking for spaces that will that I know will be sculpted by the light, that I know that the light's gonna travel and the light's gonna move in such a way that will highlight different areas. And it was brilliant working in this space. It was very challenging because it was very busy, um, but somehow, somehow we managed to frame the visitors out of the shot and that was just incredible because we couldn't close, you know, we, I couldn't ask people to close them because these are very, sacred sites and people travel hundreds of miles to go and visit it and they've only got a limited time so I can't suddenly say okay we're shooting here <laughs> you know no one can come here today for the whole day so we had to work around people um, but somehow in this chaos of you know tourists and groups of people praying we managed to find that stillness that still point which I was kind of looking for and I, which is so evocative of the poem um, Yes, there's a lot of yeah sorry there's a lot of research and development in your work here isn't there there's lots of stages of planning before you even get a camera out we're always asking our students to sort of document their process through r d and i think i mean you've clearly done this here where you've you know managed to document all of the places and how you shot but you always seem to have a very specific style that you want to achieve in that space yeah and i think it's because i intuitively want to listen to myself in terms of what I want to do and follow that process what is my what is my inquiry what is it that interests me about this project I sometimes I start with two or three questions okay. in the project and I keep get, coming back to those two or three questions sometimes I have more questions but I always come back is this helpful towards what I'm trying to explore or has the project shifted? Has the project changed? Do I need to evolve somehow my ideas? Um, it's, uh, I think it's a discipline because if you're traveling out somewhere, you've got to do your research. You've got to look at what are the places that I'm going to, who am I going to be speaking to? Um, but you know, this, this evolved over, I think two trips. So I, um, it wasn't like I just sort of arrived and I could film. I, uh, it, I, I, there was a recce first. And then from the recce, I spent several months planning the shoot. Yeah, Who would be there to help me? Who do I need to get permission from? Um, what times should I try and f try and film? And then there's always the unexpected, you know, the weather as well. What, how does that impact the shoot if it's outdoors? How do we mitigate some of the risks? If there are any risks, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's very, uh, I guess it just comes from experience. You know, I don't think I was like this when I came out of university. So, but I think that interrogation was already there because we would be interrogating each other when we were having crits at Goldsmiths. And those crits were really tough. People would come out of a session really depressed or quite often. And I would be absolutely frightened of those crits because because you would be asked things that you weren't prepared for. But actually that's part of the process. You're meant to feel a bit uncomfortable and you're meant to be comfortable with the uncomfortable so that you can grow because otherwise you're not going to grow. And, and I think that's the beauty of art projects because through it, you find out so much about yourself and about others. And that that is something that I think I can't think of any other professions where you can do that, where you can just focus on 
what makes you tick? What makes you happy? What are your values? What do you care about? The focus is on yourself, if you want it to be. You know, so I think it's, um, I can't think of any other professions that allows you that space and time to really delve into yourself if you want to. So <clears> in some ways, you kind of have no excuse but to do it properly. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so it's beautiful to see the outcomes of the work that you have developed in this way. Amazing. Now, I can't remember what the slide is. So this is more of the Top Cappy Palace. And then, you know, when I saw the shadow of that pillar and I knew the position that we were in, you know, we south facing, north facing, etc. I could predict that the shadow was going to move across. And then, therefore, this is going to be a good shot for me to film. Uh, this is extraordinary. Um, yeah. I someone was telling me about an abandoned church um, north of Nimrod Castle in Israel, and they said you just keep driving north and you will not miss it. And obviously, lo and behold, we hired a car, we went up there, and and we could not find this this uh, burnt out church. And so we kept on driving and driving, driving around, and we came across this Syrian village. So it was in the area where the Syrians had to fled because of the Six Day War in the 60s. And the place just had such a strange feeling about it. You know, there weren't any doors on the, on the buildings. The, the, the glass was all broken and there were giant bullet holes in the wall. Some of them penetrate right through the wall. And then we came across this house where you just saw this strange light that is the shape of the window, but it's cast from another window. And I, when I saw this, I thought, oh gosh, this is gonna be amazing when it moves. When that light moves and it goes up the wall, that's gonna be incredible. So that was the recce trip. And then I spent several months planning, how would we do this shoot where, you know, there's no toilets and it's stank of weed. You know, obviously you're looking at this now and you can't smell the place, but, it was just so horrendous that, uh, and I needed to be there for 12 hours to get that movement. Um, and there were so many houses that I wanted to film in. In the end, we had to hire cameras. I think we had four cameras going at the same time. And so we had to change cards because in those days, cards capacities weren't very big. So there were about eight gigabyte cards and we had to very carefully change them without knocking the camera. Yeah. Um, so that we can get the whole sequence. And I always get the whole sequence anyway and choose the point that I like within that time span. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was just incredible seeing that because in one of the shots, and I don't think it was in the, um, the excerpt, the light moves to meet the real window. Yeah. Just as it's about to meet it, it then disappears because that sun set and the light goes. And it was just magical when it happened. The you, you had, still point, yeah. You plan, you plan your shoots, and then sometimes the unexpected happens. Great. And often that there's always something within all of my films that there's always a scene that completely takes my breath away. And I think for Still Point, it is this end scenes. Very beautiful. Um, I think because of time, uh, maybe if we could move on to uh, your more more recent work, having looked at Steel Point and heard quite a lot about your process, which is fascinating, really interesting to know that you always take the whole sequence and then choose a, a point at which you will include in your edit. Um, I'm very interested in the people that you collaborate with as well in relation to sound design and science, because you've, you've got some quite specific collaborations happening, haven't you, in your more modern work? I do, um, yeah. So I think let's skip i mean by all means i think everyone's got links to lucida but i'm going to skip that project that project is about um, vision and perception and i worked with people who are blind or partially sighted but i think that's that's a piece that i think you can go you can look at it in your own time and i'll move on to conscious which is a project i'm launching oh next saturday at blue coat oh, exciting i've been at right in Liverpool and then a week later it launches in London. Cool. And it's been the culmination of five years of work. Uh, I initially started with a um, a grant from the Arts Council and then we just 
built it up and got more partners along the way. I mean, there's there's so many different partners that I think in in 11 minutes, I'm not going to be able to go. <laughs> so I think what might be interesting is to go through how I scale up from doing these little projects on my own, film shoots on my own, to now working with the film crew. Because that that wasn't an easy process, because obviously I don't have training that has allowed me to understand how a film crew works. I come from a fine art background. I don't actually know what, I didn't know what a focus puller was properly and what they did until you know a few years ago. So actually understanding what a director does, what a producer does, what a assistant director does and what you know all of those things I have no idea so I'll quickly move on and ignore these slides okay so here we are so this is this is now um not that long ago so we were filming Fog in My Head which is my latest commission with Film London and it's part of the Flaming Productions Award it's a yearly award where uh, an artist gets given £30,000 to make a film and I worked with the film crew and I also worked with an actress as well. And this is really the first time that I've worked properly with a film crew and definitely the first time of working with an actress. You know, up until this point, I hadn't really done a lot of work where I'm, I'm looking at people. You know, I always preferred architecture because they didn't move, whereas people, they move. And that's another element that I, I wasn't comfortable with actually. But now I'm really happy. I mean, I'm I'm in my element when I work with a film crew. I love it. It's um it's a different aspect of my practice that just enables me to upscale in a way that I can't do when I'm doing shoots on my own. I sometimes go back to filming on my own. I suddenly go, oh, I really could do with some help here, <laughs> you know. And so it's it's brilliant. I love it. And and so here we're we have a camera on a dolly, and then. Um, Catherine, who's a DOP, she's she's putting up um, this blackout because the light wasn't quite right. And this film is about the experiences of Wendy Mitchell, who is living with dementia. And Wendy has these um, hallucinations. And I've re I wanted to creatively recreate these hallucinations and try and bring those of us that don't have dementia into her world with dementia. For me, filmmaking is a really powerful tool that you can transport your viewers to another reality. And that for me is something that I, I, I'm loving. I, I love that aspect and I'm so driven by that. So here we are. How do we explore another aspect of time as well, somebody losing time. In, in a way yeah. and experiencing time in a different because her experiences of time is different to how we experience time yeah. and it's really fascinating i mean you know there's a lot of talk about neurodiversity and i think we all experience things differently there is no such thing as a normal it's just that there is a, a more of a a band where we all kind of live along this trajectory but actually there are outliers and i think it's just trying to see through people who are where things, you know, where, where the processes are breaking down and how, what is it like for her to be inside this fog that descends um, on bad days with dementia. And she, she can't see her kitchen cupboards. So the, the wall blends in with the white cupboards. And so she's often just she sees this protrusion from the wall, but she can't identify it as a cupboard. And that in itself is really fascinating because then you start to break down, actually, how do we perceive and how do we identify something? Those processes are happening in the brain instantly and we don't ever question it. But actually, if one part of the brain stops working, that, that seamless process then gets broken down. And you can see the thing, you know it's there, but you just can't identify it. And that itself is really fascinating. So, but it's trying to bring the viewers into that inner world that is often quite hard to explain. So, I work very closely with Wendy to try and recreate that. Um, and then that's sorry, that's the hand of the actress that you can see. That's Wendy's. It's meant to be Wendy's hand that she's yes. touching it, and but she can't. She doesn't understand what it is. And then in terms of lighting, this this is a, a house that we found, and I love the way that the light would enter into the 
the front windows at about eight o'clock in the morning and that was what we worked with but we also needed to enhance that a little bit with um with additional lighting so that mark that that lighting effect on the wall up here that is recreated because i saw that in the space and then i said i want to recreate that because obviously when you're filming that might not be happening so it's like how do you work with the light crew to try and recreate those effects um we and that again that's natural that's natural as well so these are my recce shots where i go there at different times of the day to try and see how is the light behaving and if it doesn't behave in this way on the day that we're shooting what can we do to recreate it and it's always really nerve-wracking because you kind of go into a space seeing something and then on the day when you're there with the kit and the actress you want that to happen there and then but sometimes it doesn't so it's it's exciting and it's also a bit nerve-wracking. So we had a light on a on a van. There's my one of our um, gaffers who could help with that. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh wow. So you actually moved it from outside. Yeah. To create the natural lighting. Inside. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. There's a beautiful shot where the light runs across the bottom of the window, isn't there? And it's yeah. negative. Oh, I'm giving it away. <laughs> Should we play it before I give away any more? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, let, by all means, I think that's everything that I want to show. I, I think, uh, so this is another, you know, lighting up in the spaces. And then there's us filming with COVID. Obviously, everyone's masked up. Um, yes, bless you. Um, and then this is another scene in the office where we recre recreated that fog in the office and we used a fog machine. I think that's everything. So, yeah, so why don't we end with the uh, Fog in My Head trailer and then we can open that to questions. Great. On a bad day, it's like a fog descends on the brain. My reality suddenly becomes a different reality. Familiar surroundings become unfamiliar and hazy. You really don't know what day it is, what time it is, what you're supposed to be doing. And on those days, I try and tell myself that it's not me, it's the dementia. So I have to force myself to believe in me. And so I often try and just sit quietly and wait for the fog to clear. It's like walking through a thick fog and you're in familiar surroundings but you can't see those surroundings and you can't make sense of them. Beautiful gestural work there. It's just um, lovely. I mean, how how was it was with your interest in this sort of collective consciousness with the bees and the um, the movement of the of the birds of the murmurations? How how have you linked those together with the experiences you got from your um, initial residency at the Belong Care Village? Is that what has led this process in fascination into people's minds? Okay, so with the murmurations, I think when I was fascinated with them, I loved the way that, although it's made up of thousands of starlings, individual starlings, somehow they can operate in a way that looks like it's one body. It moves in a way that feels like there's greater intelligence rather than just 
one bird always looking at seven other birds to see where they are but actually so this idea of emerging intelligence is something that i'm very interested in and then also when i see the group i think about that relationship an individual has with a wider society and how this idea that it can function as one and it's beautiful in that they're almost kind of they help one another like the starlings, the way they move, they, they, they do support each other. And then you think about other kind of animals that have that sort of social behaviour, like ants or like bees. Often they are functioning as one thing. So I, I'm very interested in that, um, you know, the social cognitive um, behaviour of these kind of insects and animals. And I guess I wonder about that with humans, you know, on, in what ways do we might, could we might operate in this way where we're maybe not thinking about the individual, but for the greater community. Um, so that's, I guess that's a pattern that I've always enjoyed and that keeps coming back within the work, you know, the, the fascination with the bees and then the fascination with memorations 15 years ago. Um, and synchronicity always happens. So I, I happen to go be, to be invited to a science, um, British Science Association summer party with a neuroscientist called um, Colin Blakemore. And there I met one of his colleagues and we, we ended up talking about consciousness the whole evening and it took a very long time. But I, you know, we were both really fascinated about this subject area and he'd been researching it for decades. Um, he's now in his 80s. And he said this thing, he said, individual bees are not conscious, but the swarm is. And then we also had this conversation about, you know, are pet dogs conscious? For me, I think dogs are conscious. And I explained my reasons. And then he said, they're not conscious for his reasons. And then for me, then I thought, God, this is a really fascinating area. And that's when I started to think, well, how can I, how can I further explore this? And then it just grew and grew and grew. And the element with dementia is, for me, this idea that when a baby is born, we're only very much a little bit aware of the world, a little bit. And then as we get older, we're more and more aware. And so you can kind of imagine this consciousness as a bell-shaped curve. So it increases to some point and then it starts to dissipate and everything starts unraveling because we lose our memories. We, we don't know who we are. We don't know our recent history. And how does that affect the, um, the identity of that person? And the concept of self. So all of this is in the project. <laughs> I'm trying to explain it in a very short period of time, but I think if people can come and see the shows, then I think it will be explained in a much more, um, in another way, because there's so many artworks. There's three uh, moving image artworks. There's a lot of photography, and there is also sound installation that is funded by Henry Moore Foundation. So we're really, really lucky to have so many big funders support this project. Um, it just feels like this is the time where people are really fascinated about this subject area and really trying to understand um, just certain things that might have been neglected in the last few years. And certainly care homes is something that people are very interested in because of what happened with COVID and, and that, um, and also this idea that we are social beings. We, we really need each other. Our interactions with each other is what makes us amazing. <laughs> um, and that's kind of in a very sort of um, grand generalization but it is that is what makes us quite special as a species and we're very successful because we can collaborate and cooperate and interact and I have loved interacting with you today so if you can thank you so much for, for being in conversation with me here um well virtually but at the <laughs> um thank so no problem at all I would I have so many more questions to ask you actually <laughs> another day another day another day but do go and see Suki's newest exhibition coming to the Blue Coat in Liverpool called Conscious which opens on the 12th of March uh, 2022 and that is followed by the Daniel Ar Arnold is that right in London yes yeah, so a week later it opens in London Brilliant. Okay, well, I, I hope to catch both of them because um, they both sound like two very different spaces that you have um, uh, sort of really, really made a, a very interesting exhibition space in each. 
the one in blue coat is perhaps more um, encompasses different aspects of the project. Um, whereas the one in Danielle Arnold, it's very much focused around the home. And that's really to do with the venue. Okay, amazing, our safe spaces. All right, thank you so much for talking. Thanks so much. Cheers, Suki, bye-bye. Take care, bye-bye.